Hi, I'm Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Miracle Voices. This is Matthew McCabe, and I have with me today guest David Hoffmeister. I was going to say special guest, but I was like, well, not, no special, yeah. right? No, no special. Take that out. There's no special. No. Yes. Yes. Say, Hi, Matt. I, Hi. I'm glad to be here. This is fantastic. And and if anybody's ever watched any uh, YouTube or search forgiveness on YouTube, you've probably seen David. He's got a lot of great content on YouTube and Spreaker and different places. And I've been listening to him for years and uh, Judy can't make it today. So it's just going to be David and I, but we might hear some people in the background there uh, talking or hear some noises. And that's uh, David's mighty companions we have also in the background. So David, welcome to Miracle Voices. Oh, thank you. I've, I, I went and checked it out and I thought, wow, this is great because you've got the app and it seems very, very uh, progressive and modern and systematized and, and even reminders going out to people. Yeah. So I think you guys are really doing a great job with the app. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Well, what we like to talk about here on, on Miracle Voices, David, and it's very, I mean, this totally dovetails with what you do, is kind of healing experiences. And you've been going through this a long time, but I was wondering for people that have not heard of you, could maybe just give a little background about, you know, the life of David and how you arrived up to this point. Yeah, well, I, I started having like a spiritual awakening. It was quite uh, amazing for me at the time, but I think it was right around the mid 1980s. And then I was guided to go out to the West Coast to La Jolla, California, where they were having a, a humanistic psychology conference, and Virginia Satir was there, and Carl Rogers, it was his last speaking uh, engagement, and there was a standing ovation that went on for like 10 or 15 minutes, uh, and just the love filled the room, and, and then the course uh, came across my path then. So from that point on, I felt like when I first picked the book up and opened it up, it was like a feeling of a tsunami of love going over me, like, and a feeling like my life will never be the same or whatever I thought I had planned for my life was, was not going to happen and something new was coming. And then I went through phases of using the course as an oracle, uh, reading it for on an average for about eight hours a day, uh, the first two and a half years. And then you, it kind of segment the parable of David. The first five years were an, a huge immersion and, and including some mystical experiences. And then there was a, a, a period of time from about 1991 to 1996 where Jesus took me like on a, like in Australia, they have walkabout with the Aborigines. Uh, Jesus took me on a walkabout around the United States and Canada with a car. I wasn't on foot like uh, Marla Morgan in, in her famous book. But so I had miracle experiences and came around to California, up to Canada, across to Wisconsin and back down to Cincinnati. And that really taught me how to hear Jesus's voice and follow his instructions intuitively uh, on the fly with, with no sense of... Uh, like letting go of all my past learning, 10 years of university and all my previous uh, learning. So that was another phase. Then after that phase came a peace house, uh, which was like a stable. That was like my, my cave, modern day cave. It was a little gingerbread looking house in Cincinnati. And that preceded launching on world travels where you know, I was donated frequent flyer miles and people started inviting me. So the world travels, I think they started around 2003 with Argentina coming first and then 43 other countries uh, coming after Argentina. And that was another phase. And then phases of uh, 
people starting to follow me and uh, you know it was like Jesus with the apostles I started to have people showing up saying you know you are the teacher I'm your student and all that kind of thing like in the teacher's manual it started to happen pretty rapidly and then that went on and started in one sense spiritual communities which over the years have have now grown to there's one in Mallorca Spain that we just were talking about and uh, and then there's one here in Mexico and one in uh, Utah. And so uh, then with the pandemic hitting, all of my 2020 uh, tours in the United States, East Coast, West Coast, and also in Europe, and speaking at a castle in the Netherlands, that was all wiped out uh, by the pandemic. And Jesus preceded all of that by telling me digital revolution. And here we are on a podcast and my friend Francis just told me people aren't watching as many videos anymore. They're in their cars and they're in their homes and the average listening time is like for 30 minutes for podcast and maybe like five, four or five minutes for a video. So there it is full circle. I'm happy and feeling joyful in uh, I'm in Mexico right now. You might hear the birds in the background. You've got a bird of paradise inches from your ear, it looks like, on yes, this video. Yes, I do. And that's just from our garden <laughs> that's here. That's a flower, yeah. But, yeah, they're amazing down here. I'm just blown away with the colors. Yeah. Uh, and I am i forgot to mention, I'm in uh, Lagos, Portugal. So we're doing the long transatlantic uh, connection here. Um, one great thing about, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have been emailing in, and it seems like everybody that's listening to this podcast is already a core student and have been studying for years. And there's some things that they're struggling with. And I've been following your work for years, David. I should probably say how I connected with you because it was really kind of amazing in its own right. At the time, I was with my family in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, which is about a four-hour drive, I think, from where you are in um, Lake Chapala. And um, I got connected to you from Bob at the Foundation for Inner Peace. And I was like, wow, it'd really be great to see David. But there was like uh, no direct way to get there. I had to go to like through two airports or something. And then I was going to drive there, but then there was these reports of like bandits on the road at that time. And I was like, I just, I guess I, I guess it won't work out this time. And I had this like unbelievable experience that after I said, like, I don't think it'll work out this time, this unbelievable experience that, uh, like I had to go like overnight. It was like this clear, clear push, like go, like go. And so I found this guy and uh, WhatsApp to drive me down there and he, he turned out to be an incredible kind of a spiritual experience driving down there. We have an all kind of spiritual discussions and, um, I made it down there and it was just so incredible to be around because I had never met anybody else to that point in person that was studying the course. I hadn't met Judy in person yet or Bob. And just to see you and your environment down there, it was like, wow, to meet Svava and everybody and the whole group and to see everybody living together, you know, working on these, integrating these principles it was just so great for me. It just like lifted me up and just like gave me confidence that I was on the right path. And uh, a lot of really positive things have happened. One more positive note that was kind of the strangest uh, coincidence is that I was in Bologna, Italy, and um, I was working in this tiny little co-working space. I was went in there for the first time. This was back in 2017. I was listening to you on YouTube and Spreaker. And, um, I walk in down this alleyway into this little co-working space. There's only like four or five desks in there. And, um, I'm listening to you on Spreaker as I walk in, just have my earphones in. I look up and there's the team for Spreaker. Um, it was the, they have their headquarters on their address. That's in New York city, but they told me, no, we're here in Bologna. And, uh, and they're like, wait, you're listening to our app. I'm like, I'm listening to it right now. I'm listening to David. They're like, oh yeah. They're like David, and uh, and 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 I couldn't believe it. I was like, "What is going on here?" I'm with like the only other people in this office are uh, the Spreaker people. David's on Spreaker. They know I'm looking at the app. I'm looking at your picture, and I'm like, "There is some sort of cosmic connection going on here uh, that I can't out explain." Out of all the places in the yeah, world, yeah, yeah. So enough a little sidetracks here, David. It's okay with you. I've been listening to I've been listening to your talks and, and lectures for years, and I actually keep notes when um, like something really jumps out at me, and I've got like pages and pages of notes I've taken over the years. But there was a couple things, or maybe a half dozen, where I was like, you know, 
I'd love to just ask David to expand on these because I think it's really helpful because a lot of times I'm listening to you and you'll just, you know, how when you go to the ophthalmologist and they, they're trying to dial in your vision and they're like, is this clear? Is this clear? Like, nope, that's blurry. That's blurry. That's blurry. And they're like, that one's clear. Like you'll say something and it's like, there's like this new filter. Like I heard it 12 different times, but I didn't viscerally understand it until that recent lens was just put down. And so with that, I just want to kind of launch on a couple. These are all from your talks, by the way. I don't know okay. if you can, you'll know Great. which ones, but. I probably okay. answered them this morning in my <laughs> session. If that's the synchronicity. You probably asked them all and then we'll go, oh yeah, I just talked about all those 45 minutes ago. It's the way the synchronicities yeah, work. Yeah. Okay. So just one thing you just jumped out at me as like, we have this whole huge course and you just said, awareness of dreaming is forgiveness. Believing you are a dream figure in the world is con- called wrong-mindedness. And I was like, wait a minute. That's the course in like one sentence. Can you expand on that at all? Yeah, I did talk about that. This you morning did talk too. about exactly See, I, that. I know. Yeah. When we're done, well, you have to go to YouTube and Facebook, and it's just for today. But yeah, that that is that is what forgiveness is because because the whole projection of of the whole cosmos and the whole world was a denial of that state of mind of being the dreamer of the dream. Because talk about empowerment, even in this world, we have parapsychology, which has been going on for decades. And there's a whole phase of parapsychology that's now into lucid dreaming. Wow, it's a huge topic now, huge theme, even in science and non-duality, you know, sand, they have people talking about lucid dreaming. Jesus calls a dreamer of the dream, where you're aware that you're dreaming. Are you defenseless? Of course. It couldn't, wouldn't matter if you had a fire-breathing dragon or a, a group of uh, planes dropping bombs or a, a tsunami or a tornado, hurricane. Is your dreaming, you quite happy because you are aware that there's nothing that can harm you. Yeah. And that's where the peace comes from. It's actually, that is the forgiven state. And then the opposite is the ego projected the whole world and then it tricked the sleeping mind into believing that it was inside of the cosmos, inside of the body. And Jesus does say, you know, how many teachers of God does it take to heal the world? One, but that one teacher is not a body or in a body. So you see what's left, dreamer of the dream, above the battleground. You see, obviously, there's only one position in the mind. So it's not so much what we're seeing that that helps us out because all of perception is the five senses are tied into the ego, but how we're seeing the world or who we're seeing the world with the Holy spirit or the ego makes all the difference, the personal perspective or the dreamer. There it is. It's, it's all in a nutshell, the whole thing. Yeah. That reminds me. So, so everything you're seeing, all five senses, this is from another one of your talks I had written down. All five senses are of the ego. So that means anything I'm perceiving out of those five sense, senses are not real, but there's a right way of using them, is what you're saying. Yeah, that's that's the beginning of the mind training of the workbook of Course in Miracles, where Jesus starts off with nothing I see means anything. And then he quickly, uh, he he reminds us, I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me, which is really the ego is projecting the world and giving false meanings to everything, including the five senses. And then you get into the thoughts. Uh, These thoughts do not mean anything in number four. And then number 10 is my thoughts do not mean anything. So he's trying to make the connection experientially in the workbook that the thoughts that you think you think are actually images. And the world that you think you see are images. And they're the same. So for human beings, we perceive a world that seems to be external to our brain and to our person. It's an external world. And he's saying, no, that that body and that world are all thoughts and they're all images and they haven't left your mind. It's all just a world of ideas. It's totally mental. All illness is mental illness. 
So you start to, that's what that workbook does. It, it actually takes you into an experience that you're the dreamer of the dream, which yeah. is the escape hatch. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the movies you did, you do these movie talks where you, you talk before a movie, you watch the movie together, everybody on Zoom and kind of interrupt it and say, okay, now let's look at how this relates to the course. And then afterwards, you kind of do a debrief. And one of the movies you did not too recently, but was profound was uh, Lucy. And in that movie with uh, Scarlett Johansson, kind of a spoiler alert here too, for someone that's seen it or anybody that's seen it at the very end of the movie, she, um, she's kind of scrolling through time, like with her hand going through like the history of like humanoids, apes, and like, every, you know, like everything all the way back and going back and forth, like it's a book and then can kind of jump into it, like jump, jump into a page. And that page is kind of like life. Would, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I think from a reincarnational perspective, what, what, would be considered an incarnation is almost like a a little blip of of what seems to be images and jesus when when jesus was helen shuckman you know he was saying yeah what you what you consider a whole lifetime is just she almost missed it they almost flew right past an entire lifetime so it's very much like lucy you know that these are just segments of time and the ego uh keeps us in a sense of amnesia of forgetting the holy instant forgetting the light and keeping to make the same mistake over and over kind of like in groundhog day where phil the weatherman you know steps in the puddle until he doesn't until his awareness reaches the point and he he hovers his foot over the top and he does not step in the puddle that's kind of what it is with time we seem to play out the same belief in separation over and over, day after day with different family configurations, with different uh, situations that we might even call lifetimes, but they aren't really lifetimes. They're just switching the channel back and forth, still trying to look for salvation and love in the form. Yeah. And the form was made by the ego to keep us from remembering the love, the real love, the light. So it's it's kind of interesting. And then that whole talk I gave this morning, it was just about how this uh, physicist, Brian Green, you know, he mapped out the whole cosmos and it looks like a loaf of bread. And I was saying, we just think that we've been inside it, but we're, we haven't. You know, when we dream, we can see the loaf of bread very clearly and, and we know that it's not who we are. But when we forget that we're dreaming, then, oh my gosh, it opens up Pandora's box seemingly of struggles in time constantly being challenged wow it's so, it's so crazy these things like it, it makes sense when you explain it it's very it's very clear the thing you said like when you wake up and you're in this lucid dream like hey i'm in this lucid dream it's the escape hatch but then we still have these like out of our awareness this guilt and um sometimes resentment the course calls grievances and this guilt is there and it's, we can't see it, but we experience it and then kind of project it onto relationships and different things in the world. And so when we experience this guilt, how do we then, un it's like a big fishing knot. Like how do you undo this knot if you can't see it? It's, and it seems to be everywhere. And then it kind of goes away for a while. Like what happened? And then it comes back. Like how, how do you let that, that guilt up and out? Well, that was when I first got into the course and started to really get deeper. That was my first question to Jesus. Like, I'm out of touch. I'm out of touch with my emotions. I'm at, out of touch with my beliefs. And I remember Jesus one time he described, it might have even been one of an absence from Felicity or one of the accessory uh, writings, but he described the unconscious mind as the unwatched mind. And I thought, wow, unwatched. And he says, yeah, it's completely hidden from awareness. It's like it's sealed. And he talks about that in the course where he says it's like the self-concept is a two-tier self-concept. The top one is the one you perceive. It's called the face of innocence. And then the other one is the dream you dream in secret, which is, he says, draped in sin. Draped in sin. And he said, that's why you made the top tier. You can't 
even bear to look upon it. So my first question to Jesus was, I think I'm pretty asleep here. I, I'm, I'm really unconscious here. Even my friends could say, you know, David is more in his head and he's intellectual and he's, he's not in touch with his feelings. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not at all. So the course came and my first relationship on planet Earth and this go around uh, all came and university, <laughs> grad school all came at once. A perfect storm, like with Kevin Costner, to blast open my unconscious mind, where I felt like, how do people do this? Relationships, grad school, and A Course in Miracles. I said, that seems like an impossible combination. And Jesus was like laughing, saying, now we begin to go underneath to the unconscious mind. Yeah. So all of the, I would say, relationships are are a primary tactic by Jesus to, to get in touch with what's out of awareness. You know, it's so strong. The emotions come up so intense and so quick, like little quick flesh storms. Yeah. And relationships and silence. Most people have a spiritual practice with some kind of meditation. I found you put relationships and meditation together. Whoa, that's dynamite. That's explosive for unveiling. And then when you bring in, like, I never thought I even knew what a spiritual community was. If somebody had asked me when I was in my teens or 20s, I'd say, what's that? I mean, I, I, I wasn't born in California or some of these progressive places, right, you right. know, Asheville, North Carolina, or Northern California, Berkeley, you know, I was born in Cincinnati. So I'm like, what's a spiritual <laughs> community? I don't even know what that is. But Jesus brought all these symbols, but it's, it's like you with your family, there's a lot of intense reflections. And imagine with 15 or 20 other people. Even Judy, I think one time Svava and I were with her and Svava was talking with her and she said, you know, there was a time when I, I tried to get the original four and, and our partners all together to live under the same roof. And they were, she was all excited and they said, no way, <laughs> absolutely no way. And you know how it is. Being a course practitioner with a wife and, and your children, yeah, you know, that's a cooker. Just that <laughs> yeah, is yeah. a cooker. You can only imagine Ken and, and Bill and Helen and Judy living in the same house with, with Wit and Gloria. You know, it, it was untenable. So that's what I found is the way to do it is you let the spirit guide you and then more stuff comes up in a more of a rapid way. And that's the way you rapidly kind of get through that pool of darkness that's pushed out of mind. So it sounds like you're saying that um, you're listening to guidance. And when you hear that, it's like, well, wait a second. We talked about your, your five sentences are not the senses that are real. You can interpret them with the Holy Spirit, but there's another sense that you start your intuition, which you start to listen to and as that grows stronger, you can trust in it much more. And it's like, oh, I'm going to start to go with the intuition here. And the tu and, and then things start to happen. And then you trust it even more. And then more starts to happen. And problems not necessarily go away, but sometimes recontextualize to where they're not problems anymore. Yeah, that's it. I, I do. I was just reading through a section of the course the other day where Jesus was saying that he said, only I can perform miracles indiscriminately because of my acceptance of the atonement. From he's he's gone past time and space, so that's a good guide. And he said, only I can perform miracles indiscriminately, so I can direct you uh, where to perform them. And 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 under my guidance, the the miracles will lead to revelation. Revelation. That's direct glimpse of direct union with God. So I read that passage and I went, that's why the guidance is so important because under Jesus's guidance, it leads to an experience of revelation. And that is, that's the waking up from the dream. That's, yeah. that's the whole point. You have to do a lot of forgiveness, but under the guidance, it collapses time. So what could have taken centuries or even more millennium it it comes down to saving thousands and thousands of years so that was my next thing after how do i get in touch with the unconscious 
Jesus said, oh, I'll show you. And then you need to be under my guidance to collapse time, to really move towards the light if you really want to wake up. In this lifetime, so to speak, you really have to give it all over to the guidance and be 100% intuitive. That's the way I see it now. Yeah. Yeah. And so some of the things that I, I learned from you, 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 you and uh, your mighty companions there use the term ego backlash. And I had not heard that until I heard, heard you mention that. And I didn't know what that was. And then as I started immersing myself in this more and my wife too, you know, we're really, really trying to integrate these principles all of a sudden for no apparent reason, just for like a day or two, just feels like I, you know, you think a little bit about St. John of the Cross, like dark night of the soul, like there's like this darkness, this despair, just terrible feelings, but they're, they're psychic, like, but they, they affect the body. And it's just like, where did this come from? When is it going to go away? Um, it's just, it feels terrible. And then I was like, and then as it goes away, was it, was that, you know, was I just ready to let something up there and it came up? Like, wh- wh- how do you describe that? Yeah, ready is a good word. Like somewhere deep in our mind, when we're willing and ready, uh, then it's almost like, like, like when the temperatures warm with global warming and and certain huge chunks of icebergs start to break off in Antarctica or the North Pole or even in South America, Patagonia down down at the end of Argentina. That's kind of how it happens. Like when the time is right and and the temperature is warm enough through our willingness and our desire for healing, then these chunks will come up. And it's like, whoa, sometimes it's intense right out of seemingly nowhere. It's out of the unconscious mind yeah. is where it's coming from. And then it's it can floor you. It, it's like, like being a boxer and getting knocked knocked out or just completely knocked off your your compass for your your worldly life. So I discovered I had to really be prepared for that. Like, wow, if that's going to happen, even every once in a while, that that seems dysfunctional. That seems like you know you can't function when that's happening. And and the spirit was like, yeah, well, that's that's how it goes. There's six stages mentioned in the manual for teachers of the development of trust. And four of them are difficult. Two thirds of them are described as difficult or challenging, disorienting. So, you know, Jesus has just given it to us straight with the course. He's like, he's not pulling any punches. He's not beating around the bush. He's taking us in a in the most direct way and gentle way <laughs> possible. But to the ego, it's not gentle at all because it's just reacting all over the place. Yeah. This is like a chunk. That is a good description of it. Um, another thing that you mentioned in one of your talks, um, and when someone tells you like, Hey, you never, the course is saying you never did anything wrong. You never did anything wrong. There's nothing to get guilt about. But one of your talks, you said you never did anything wrong or right. And I, and that made me think like, well, wait a second here. You know, I, I, we brought some food to that widow. And I mowed that person's lawn. How dare you? I, I do things right all the time. Like this, I want, it's like, there's a part that's like, I want credit for these right things. Like I want something in the asset column here, not just the liabilities. Like, yeah. but, but that, that kind of shook me. Like, it's like throwing water in your face. You didn't do anything right. Like, nah, like I, I really, you know, there's part of me that needs to believe like I, I, I needed to, I needed something right, but you're saying they're both equally wrong. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, under to the Holy Spirit, the body is neutral, and it's a, a learning device. Jesus says, the under the Holy Spirit's interpretation, the body is a learning device for bringing you home, bringing you back to heaven or the light. And the ego projects everything that's in the mind to the body. So it projects making decisions, which are really only happening at the level of mind, to the body, as if persons make decisions, good decisions and bad decisions. Jesus is saying, no, it's purpose is the only choice. You you basically, the only reverberation of choice that, that you really have, that you could even call free, it's not really free until you see that there's no choice at all in heaven, but that's God's free will. But in terms of choice, you always are limited to the range of the right mind and the wrong mind. You're, you're choosing the Holy Spirit or the ego, the purpose 
life or death, you know, remembrance of life or, or this death wish, every moment, every second of every day. That's pushed out of awareness. So it seems like we're trying to make good personal decisions, do good deeds, and be, you know, do-gooders and, and so forth. And for a while, of course, we have to interpret the symbols of the world in terms of what's helpful and what's not. And, you know, helping, offering charity or being used in a way, we still relate to the body because it's such a big part of our perception. You know, it's a central part. <laughs> we call it home. <laughs> we use the word my <laughs> in yeah. front of body. You know, it's very, uh, very much our home. It's all projected by the ego. So I did a, a little pamphlet years ago called Purpose is the Only Choice, where it's like the Holy Spirit unwinds our mind back from form and takes us back to content, which is love. But we're so invested. He does tell us at one point, he said, the Holy Spirit only has two orders of thought. And I'm like, I need to know what, what are those? He said, the Holy Spirit only knows love and a call for love. The Holy Spirit doesn't know attack. That's totally of the ego. And he says in the course, in the text, he says, but you can't understand this because you're too bound to form and do not understand what content is at all. So I'll say content is love. It's in our mind, our divine mind. And then the whole journey is starting to practice to choose the purpose of the Holy Spirit instead of the ego's purpose, which is hatred, guilt, fear, pain, death. And as you do that, you don't make any attempt to, to change the world. And you also start to realize that your body never made any mistakes, and it never did anything right either. Why is that? It, what do you mean it never did anything right or wrong? It's because there's two beliefs in the mind that are guarded by the ego and kept hidden. And those two beliefs are that the, the, the mind can miscreate in the body, which is saying the body can make mistakes, or that the body can miscreate in the mind. And that's when you have course students saying, well, you're just projecting onto me and I'm projecting onto you. And I projected this guilt and made cancer in the body. And no, Jesus is saying, no, no, actually the mind can't miscreate in the body and the body can't miscreate in the mind. Only God creates and you as Christ are a co-creator in spirit in heaven. But there's no creation going on down in the level of form. Also, there's no good things and bad things. Like, you know, there is no good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Right. But ego thinking has now projected the split in the mind into good behaviors and bad behaviors. And most religions are about do enough of the good things and the good rituals, Hail Marys or acts right. of generosity or whatever. And the few, as few sinning, dark... <laughs> actions as you can and you maybe get close <laughs> yeah. but jesus is saying no it's it's a purification in the mind it's not happening in form form is a projection it's a it's an unreal effect of an unreal cause don't even go there don't yeah. try to to find your salvation in in behavior because behavior is just an effect you have to change the cause yeah the, the thinking in the mind yeah that that relates to another th something you said about uh, notice how the ego is always trying to add or change something in the dream. Uh, it, you should have no desire to add or subtract anything from the dream because if you do, it's just that it's making it real. But I noticed that, and you talk about this, is that there's always this little like, uh, well, that didn't work out, but if you can just over here and then we get that more money, that problem goes away, lose weight. It's like, there's like a carrot and a stick there. Like if we eliminate this pain, or if there's more money, or you're in better health in the future, then, and that is, um, it's amazing how much that is, it just, that can just morph into new things over and over and over. And I mean, it comes into my mind all the time, um, and I just have to catch myself like, wow, this is like incessant, 
how much there's like, okay, here's a new thing to think it can complete you. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah. If, if we use like an analogy of, um, of a computer where you have like a default program or even better, a default operating system, you know, it goes back a bit to MS DOS and some of those old, you know, what's your default operating system. Now do you use iOS or you Android, you know, what's your operating system. If you, if you actually start to realize that the default program is a, is a thinking, it's a belief system and thinking and the ego's thought system and belief system is completely different from the Holy Spirit's. In fact, never the twain shall meet. Perfect love cast out fear, the Bible says. And 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 if you don't experience perfect love, Jesus says it's it's because you still have fear. You, you retain thousands of scraps of fear in your mind, and it has never seriously uh, crossed your mind to let go of all of them. Like, oh yeah, that's the problem. It's these attack thoughts. It's these scraps of fear. So what happens, though, is the default program is so focused on the world because of the body that it's like, if I just had a little more money, if I just save a little more, had a little more education, do a little more exercise, lose a little weight, you know, if I just take that extra seminar and polish those skills, that that I'll have a better life. And it's always trying to add something. Jesus says that you're always trying to add something to the script every day. Then he comes around and says, without judgment are all things equally acceptable. Wow. That's a, that is, that's a bring us back into heaven thing. And yet, how do you go from, from all the preferences and all of these little idiosyncrasy opinions and things that are part of the human condition. How do you reach without judgment are all things equally acceptable or all things work together for good? There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. That seems like a pretty high bar. And again, yeah. the answer is, is guidance. Yeah. So the ego thought system is a, is a system of judgment. And the Holy Spirit and Jesus are like, okay, it's fake. We know it's fake, but we're fine with fake. We can use fake. We can use anything the ego made. So the ego made judgment, so we're going to use it. So Jesus says that guidance, judgment is evaluative. And guidance, even our guidance, like for you to, to walk into that uh room in Cologne or wherever where you had the speaker yeah. and you were listening to me and you walked into speaker headquarters <laughs> uh, without knowing it, yeah. that's guidance. That would be like something prompted you to go down that alley and go into that, that room. And then you had this kind of, wow, deja vu kind of expansive, like what is happening to me? How could this even be? I'm listening yeah. to David on speaker and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, David. And yeah. you're like, yeah, yeah, like it's surreal. But that thing, that nudge that prompted you to walk down that alley was the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And and that's a, that's a decision. You could have walked down many alleys, gone on many streets, gone into many doors. But you see, the guidance is to take us to a point where we finally transcend the judgment and realize we never could judge anything good or bad. We We were just attempting something that we weren't created to do. We were incapable of judgment. Not that we should stop it, but we never were capable of it in the first place. So that's the miracle. That's the atonement. It takes us prior to time, prior to all the good and bad. And and you still are practical. I I always find Jesus is practical because the last 35 years I've had with the Course, I could write volumes or do volumes of podcasts on Miracle stories, they're, they're always so practical. They always, like that experience you had with the speaker, that brought you into an experience. Yeah, And that's, that's what the guidance is de- designed to do. And then, of course, Jesus takes us all the way to Revelation. He's, he's not stopping with a few glimpses here or there. He's like, oh, you're the whole, you are the kingdom of heaven, and you're not going to be satisfied until you really remember it. So it's, it's quite a journey. It really is. Well, dude, I've got so many, I got pages of notes I could go through with you here. But as we were talking about, people listen to podcasts in their car when they're working out, um, they're doing commutes. 
on their, on a train or something like that. So they kind of like them to keep them short. Um, I'm going to put in the show notes, everything, all the different ways to find you on YouTube and Twitter and everything and the uh, living miracles website. But I always try to be, you know, as much as I can super practical, because that's what I want. You've, you've been doing this for so long, for so many years and people seem, um, they come to you with questions. How do I do this? How to do, how do I do this? Is there one thing that you feel like, Hey, if you're struggling with something like what, what's the best thing to, what's the, what's the question you get the most and what's the answer you give, I guess is what's the, at the top of your frequently asked question list, what, what's the, the number one question? Oh yeah. The number one question around the world that I've gotten for the last 35 years over 44 countries is how did, how did the separation happen? Okay. Uh, which, which Jesus addresses in the uh, manual for teachers, uh, clarification of terms, you know, how did the impossible happen to whom did the impossible happen? He says, the ego will ask many questions that this course has no answer for. And then he goes on though, as always to say, there is an experience that will come that will end your doubting. You notice he doesn't say a theology or a concept. He says there's an experience that will come to end your doubting. So I always say, let's engage together and join together in going for that experience. Let's be mighty companions together and just we'll make a pact. We're going to accept this atonement. We're going we're to wake up from this dream. And even Bill and Helen, when they were scribing and, and typing out the course, they did ask Jesus that question after a number of chapters. They said to Jesus, pardon, pause, can we pause just a little bit? We have one little question. How did this happen in the first place? You know, and Jesus said, it's a good question. And you can tell by your daily emotions that you believe that it did happen. You can tell by your emotions that you believe that it did. And then this course is an answer to go for that experience where you forgive that belief in separation and, and wake up. So it's, it's, yeah, that's the number one question though, by far. Yeah, I could see that. I could see why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, David, thanks so much for coming on Miracle Voices. Thanks for your Miracle Voice. We really appreciate it. Also, um, hopefully we can do this again when Judy can come back on. If you're available, we can schedule something again and the three of us can yes, uh, yes. jump on. Okay. Absolutely. I look forward to it. And, uh, and and it can be on based on her timing. Whenever you and her have, have an opportunity, anytime, I'll, I'll schedule it in. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.